Hi, I want to demonstrate the contribution that Morse code made to the safety of life at sea. Now, first of all, I would like to emphasize that all the audio tracks that you hear on this video are authentic. They were made by radio officers at sea at the time the events were occurring. Now, I want you to take a leap in the imagination and come back with me into the 1950s. And we'll pretend we're aboard the Mauritania, a Cunada, leaving Liverpool, bound for New York. And we're going to look over the shoulder of Sparks, one of the radio officers nominated to keep a watch on 500 kilocycles. That's the Morse code, distress and calling frequency. Right, the first job Sparks must do is to get the ship into the system. And to get the ship into the system, he passes a TR, a traffic report, to his nearest coal station. In this case, that's Seaforth Radio, call sign Golf Lima Victor. Now the TR consists of the ship's name, her position, and where she's bound. And if Sparks passes a TR to every coal station along his route, then uh, interested parties ashore can monitor the progress of the ship. But that humble TR also plays an important part in the safety of life at sea, because if anything happens to the ship, she goes missing or something, we have a record of her last known position and her course. I'll give you an example. I remember a winter's night in the north of Scotland. Pitch black. A storm howling out of the east. Horizontal rain. There were two of us on watch in Wick Radio Station. Then in the wee small hours of the morning, a distress call booms out of the speaker. We get the ship's name and her position. She's on the stacks of Dunkersby. That's a reef that runs out from the northeast of Scotland with pillars of rock rising out of the sea. And we get no more silence. So we start the, start the alarm signals going to alert all ships. Then one of us passes the message to the Coast Guard while the other guy passes the message to the Admiralty. Then we dash back and we rebroadcast the message to all ships. The next thing is the Coast Guard contact us. They're at the top of the cliffs and there are two paths going down. Don't forget they're in the storm, pitch black, driving rain. Which path should they take? So we checked the TR. The ship was bound north, heading north. So she was blown in, she's hit the southern side of the stacks. And right enough, first thing in the morning at first light, there she was on the south side. Unfortunately, in this case, she was upside down and all the crew were lost. But that's the way it goes. Some you lose, some you win. But it's not a game, we're dealing with people's lives. They have a nickname for the sea in the north of Scotland. They call it the Widowmaker. All right, Sparks, to you. As you can see from that tape, radio officers communicate in Morse code, but they speak a language of their own. They speak an international language which is comprised of international signals like TR and CQ, which means calling all stations, and they use Q codes and abbreviations. So in that last clip, the clip you've just seen, um, GTTM was the Mauritania. Um, QTO GLV means leaving Liverpool. QRD WSL means bound for New York. And nil means I have no traffic for you, which um, in the case of the Mauritania would be a bit dodgy. But anyway, now listen to this next clip because it brings out some very important points. What I want to emphasize is that you'll hear TTT, which is the safety signal, da, 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 then a very faint urgency signal, XXX, da, di, di, da, da, di, di, da, da, di, di, da, which is then jammed out by another safety signal, TTT, da, da, da. So even if you don't understand Morse code, listen out for those signals.
you heard there was Night and Radio in the Isle of Wight uh, sending TTT a safety signal then announcing a gale warning which he would send on 464 killer cycles. Think me in the background you might have also heard Valencia Radio making a similar announcement. Now a safety signal is used before a gale warning and it's also used to announce any navigational warning, uh, boys out of place, floating debris, anything, anything that is uh, a danger to shipping, and ice warnings, of course. <clears throat> um, then you heard Lingby Radio in Denmark sending, a very faintly, sending XXX, which is the urgency signal. Now, an urgency signal is only one down from distress. You get SOS, then XXX, then TTT. That's the priority list. Urgency signal is used to announce that somebody has been washed overboard, um, somebody uh, is injured or sick and needs medical assistance, or a ship has broken down and needs a tow. So those are all urgency messages. So that was Lingby Radio in Denmark broadcasting on behalf of a ship. But he was then jammed out by TTT again, uh, this time being sent by uh, Genoa Radio in Italy. And it, actually, he was announcing a gale warning too. So there you had an urgent message being jammed out by less urgent messages. Um, this was all under control because um, Lingby was actually a long way away. The other stations were closer and there was nothing we could do about whatever uh, Lingby had to say. And he was actually broadcasting on behalf of the ship. It, it wasn't a ship that was suddenly in trouble. It was something that was under control. quite faint, no matter how urgent or desperate it is, can be jammed out by closer signals. So if that was a ship in distress out in the ocean, um, you could have had a tragedy on your hands. So how do we get around that? Well what we do, every half hour on the distress frequency we have a three minute silence period when every radio officer drops what he's doing and he listens. Now, um, the silence periods are at 15 minutes past the hour and 45 minutes past the hour. But as you know, ships are spread all over the world and they're all on different times. So how do we get around that? Well, the answer is, every ship's radio room is on the same time. They're all on GMT. So every radio officer, when he looks at his clock, sees the same time. If I look at my clock and see 12 noon, you look at your clock, and you see 12 noon, no matter who you are, I am, or where we are. So right, now we have it that every radio officer in the world speaks the same international language and is on the same international time. Now that's the ideal situation for search and rescue operations. And this silence period is self-regulated by radio officers because they all know how important it is. I remember one time somebody handed me a message for his ship and I started sending the message called calling the ship. Then I looked up and I saw the clock and I was right in the middle of the silence period so you know but somebody in Spain heard me and reported me and I had to give a written explanation. That's how it is, it's self-regulated. So now you'll see a picture of a radio room clock 
and on it you'll see the silence periods clearly marked and round the rim of the clock you'll also see what appears to be four minute segments in red they are actually for the second sweep and that's to help the radio officer when he has to send the automatic alarm signal but you get more about that later right this next clip is Lands End Radio relaying a distress message on behalf of the Toledo now even if you don't understand Morse code listen out for the letters D D D Da Diddy Da Diddy Da Diddy that bracket the distress signal SOS now the reason Lands End sends DDD before and after the signal is that he is relaying the message on behalf of a ship. Now the first instinct you've got when you hear SOS is to reach for the direction finder, take a snap bearing so you can home on the signal. But if you're homing on somebody who is only relaying the distress call or distress message um, you're going to lead to all kinds of confusion. So what we do, if you're relaying on behalf of another vessel, relaying a distress message that is, on behalf of another vessel, you prefix the distress signal D D D da di di da di di da di di. So listen out for that. just called in at Cove, we took on boat passengers and mail and now we're heading for New York. We're following the same routine as the Titanic but she hit an iceberg. We won't hit an iceberg because the southern limit of icebergs is 39 north so we keep below 39 north and there are people out there tracking icebergs and of course we've got the safety signals TTT if one has actually strayed into our path. So now we sail along and we find that the distress frequency 500 kilocycles is quite quiet. we a long way from America, we're getting further and further from Europe, all the signals have all faded. Except we might hear something like, what's that Sparks? series of four second dashes separated by one second intervals that's the automatic alarm signal now the automatic alarm signal is sent before a distress call and it's supposed to ring bells on every ship within about a 200 mile radius the auto alarm became compulsory uh, after the Californian missed the Titanic's distress call the Californian was within six or twenty miles of the Titanic at the time depending on his story, I believe. So then they made the auto alarm compulsory. Um, sobering thought here is that um, Cyril Evans, who was the radio officer on the Californian at the time, stayed at sea till he died in 1959. Now I went to sea in 1951, 1951. So we were both at sea at the same time and I was doing the same job as him at the same time. It's a sobering thought again, you know. What's string to that? But anyway, that's the autom automatic alarm seal, so what happens next?
that's an American ship and she's going down in a rough sea and this is for real that radio officer sent that distress call with the ship sinking beneath his feet and it was perfect Morse code all the way now she's too far away for us to help so what's going to happen next? That's a Norwegian ship going to the rescue and she should be there in a couple of hours. Now, so what happens now is we're on the stricken ship. The crew will put the lifeboats over the side and the radio officer will stay at his post communicating with the rescuers. Then at the last minute he'll switch on an automatic keying device which will send SOS, SOS, SOS and he'll make a dash to the lifeboat. He get in the lifeboat and he's got a transceiver in there. And so he can monitor the situation from the lifeboat and the ship will act as a big beacon on which the rescuers can home until she goes down and sinks. So, okay, what happens if the radio officer doesn't make it to the lifeboat? And that happens because I personally had two colleagues who went down with their ships while they were sending SOS and they were drowned. So that does happen. So what happens then, the crew in the lifeboat still have the transceiver and they can switch on an automatic keying device and the auto key will keep sending SOS, SOS, SOS. 